It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 152, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Scott Chasky is the director of Quail Hill Farm, one of the original community-supported agriculture farms in the United States. Located in Amagansett, New York, on land donated to the Peconic Land Trust, the farm also delivers fresh food to local restaurants, food pantries, and the Sag Harbor Farmer's Market. Quail Hill's 250-member families harvest their own food each week from the 35 acres of vegetable production. And Scott digs into the nitty-gritty of how that process works. We also discuss the ways that Quail Hill works to keep the community involved in the farm through its advisory committee and other mechanisms. Scott shares how he worked in the early years to build up the depleted soil at Quail Hill Farm, how they maintain it now, and how they've met the challenge of a nut sedge infestation. We also discuss the farm's advanced apprenticeship program, Scott started food production while living in Cornwall, and how Scott has made time and space for writing poetry and prose while managing the farm. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear-driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSamerica.com and by Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost-based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com And by Farmers Web, software for your farm. Farmers Web makes it easier to work with your buyers, saving time, reducing errors, and increasing your capacity to work with more buyers overall. FarmersWeb.com Scott Chasky, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Uh, thank you. Really wonderful to be here, Chris. So I'd like to start off today by having you tell us about Quail Hill Farm, where you guys are located and, and what you're doing there. Okay, so we are located in um, a little hamlet called uh, Amagansett, New York, uh, about as far out as you can go on Long Island, uh, two and a half hours from New York City. And we are part of an organization called the Peconic Land Trust, and we have been operating as a CSA for, this is our 28th year, as a matter of fact, um, out here on the east end of Long Island, Uh, although the actual CSA started two years before that in another hamlet, uh, Bridgehampton, in 1988. And Quail Hill Farm is strictly a CSA farm, right? Well, we are a CSA farm. That's mainly a CSA farm, and that certainly was why we were founded, and that is our identity. Uh, However, like all small farms, we, um, you know, need to do a lot of different things to to bring in the bread. And uh, so we sell at the farmer's market. We uh, sell wholesale. We do some do some other field work like mowing and that sort of thing for other neighbors. Uh, so, you know, we do a bunch of different things, but the major part of the operation and the, the foundation of it is the CSA. How big is Quail Hill Farm? We we started in 1988 with 10 families and, uh, you know, grew pretty quickly to about 150 families. Uh, and now we're at about 250 families, and that's maybe between 600 and 700 people. And uh, in area, we're uh, farming about 35 acres for the CSA, although we're on a preserve uh, uh, that is 220 acres. And so we do tend more land than the 35 acres that we grow on for the for the CSA. But that's, you know, we started with four acres and a hand push rototiller. And uh, here we are 28 years later with five tractors and a lot more acreage. And Scott, what's what's your role on the farm? Because if I understand right, you don't actually you're not the farm owner here. You're you're an employee. Correct. I'm actually I have an unusual position, I think, for 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 a farmer in that I'm a a salaried farmer. I actually work for the Peconic Land Trust and Quail Hill Farm is not a separate entity. Uh, In other words, we, we don't have a bank account. Our our. Are the money that comes in and flows out of Quail Hill Farm all flows through the Peconic Land Trust. And the Peconic Land Trust is a larger umbrella organization, and I'm my salary is paid by the Peconic Land Trust. It's a it's an unusual setup for a for a farmer, but one that 
I actually um, admire and and enjoy, and I have for many years, and I I've never actually felt the need to own the land. And I think in a lot of ways, for a CSA farm, being a salaried employee really does make a lot of sense because it is the ultimate sharing of the risk by the other partners and not having that risk be on the farmer. Yeah, that's very true. And when you know, this was um, this was really an organic. Uh, an organic happening. I mean, when we began, it was all an experiment and it was quite new. No one had heard of CSA before, uh, including uh, John Halsey, who uh, started the land trust in 1983. The idea of the CSA was brought to him in 1989. And uh, and he said, well, that's an interesting concept. And uh, then began the experiment. And I still think of it as a kind of experiment. Um, 28 years later, but for many years, we were the only ones in the country doing this, the only land trust operating a community farm. And people, uh, I, I, I took many calls from people who said, you know, asking sort of questions like you're asking now, like how, what's the setup? Uh, how does it run? Who owns the land? Is there a lease? You know, all that sort of thing. Well, so, okay, I'm going to continue to ask those questions. So mm-hmm. you said the farm started in 1988. But the idea of the CSA was brought to the land trust in 1989. Can you talk to us a little bit about how the CSA got started for you and then how it got incorporated into the Peconic Land Trust? Yeah, I think that's a really important question, uh, especially when you consider that CSA was just brand new. I mean, it had, you know, Indian Line Farm in Temple Wilton had just begun in 1986. So it was the beginning of CSA in this country. and um, I actually got involved. I said this was an organic process. I got involved because my father-in-law, wonderful man who is a sculptor, Bill King, and my mother-in-law, who's a painter, Connie Fox, uh, were members of the uh, of this first CSA. There were 10 families. They heard about it. They got excited about it. We were living, my wife and I were living in England at the time. I spent 10 years living in England. We came back to this country and... Um, my father-in-law said, uh, why don't you come along to this meeting of, a, of a something called Community Supported Agriculture that we're involved in? And I said, well, that sounds interesting. And uh, I went, and, and here I am, 28 years later. <laughs> and uh, I think the idea being brought to John Halsey, who was, you know, founding this land trust, um, it was only six, seven years old at the time, um, I think it had that kind of excitement for him. He He had... The land trust had basically been given land. Uh, eventually, it was 220 acres of land um, by one woman, Deborah Light. And uh, the land trust had to figure out mm, what to do with it. It was its prime farmland. The soils are beautiful. And, uh, and, and this idea of community agriculture was an exciting thing to dive into. So that's, that's how that connection took place. But as I said, it was really an experiment uh, in, in the beginning. Um, there weren't really any models for us to fall back onto. And were you hired by the Peconic Land Trust right from the beginning to be the farm manager? Yeah, actually, I was hired. There was another fellow who was excited uh, about um, biodynamics, actually, and, and and about he was really a gardener, but he was excited about biodynamics. He heard about community supported agriculture. He took the idea to John Halsey and I had just moved back from England and I came on as a, I was really not an apprentice because I was in my late thirties at the time and I had lots of gardening experience, but I came in as a, as a farm worker and then took over about a year and a half later. And I've had, I don't know, four or five different titles since that time, but I've been doing the same thing. Uh, and, and now I'm, um, technically known as the director of Quail Hill Farm. But when you say you're the director, you're still out driving tractors. I am. I love that part of it, actually. And um, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to give that part up. So I'm uh, uh, I, I am nearing uh, nearing the time where I'm pulling back, uh, you know, but um, I'm still out there um, plowing and disking and planting. I love the seeding uh, aspect of it. And I'm not doing so much of the harvesting, the younger ones are doing that, but I'm, I'm out in the field every day. How is the CSA structured at Quail Hill Farm? How are members involved? 
are they just are they signing up for shares and and getting a box for a certain amount of money or are you guys running this in kind of the the classic Indian line farm way of having these you know meetings in the fall and presenting the budget and passing the hat until everybody until you have enough money to run the farm for the year how does that work at Quail Hill Farm Yeah that's a really good question and of course a major part of the answer to that is that there is an umbrella organization. So a fair amount of the administration, et cetera, you know, happens, um, happens there. And so we aren't structured like Temple Wilton. We do have meetings. We have a, we, as the, the member involvement is very important. And, and, you know, I'm sure we'll talk more about the community aspect of, of community supported agriculture. Uh, but, uh, the uh, most unusual thing about our structure is that the members, you know, purchase a, a share at the beginning of the year, obviously, uh, but they actually come and harvest their own food. And this is, well, I'm sure we'll talk more about this, but we have two harvest days a week, Tuesday and Saturday during the summer season. And uh, the members actually come and go out in the field and harvest their own food. We, It's not a box share. Although in the last couple of years, because some of the members are now in their 80s or uh, 90, as a matter of fact, and they're not able to go out in the field and harvest the way they still you know, used to. So we do provide a box share for those members. But it, it's since the beginning, it's been structured because those original 10 families wanted to get their hands in the in the earth. They wanted to dig carrots and dig potatoes and all that sort of thing. And so that's, that's really how it works. Then we have a, another important part of the structure is the farm committee. And, uh, you know, I think there's a really important part of, of community agriculture and that committee is, is known as an advisory committee. It's not a board. The, the Peconic Land Trust has a board of directors that, you know, uh, assures the operations uh, of the Conic Land Trust, and we we are under that jurisdiction, but we have an advisory committee that's extremely important and helps to decide uh, what's happening on the farm. Basically, I'm really curious that you know in this nuts and bolts level about this member harvest. So mm. I've I've talked to CSA farms where members came out and participated in the harvest, and then helped to wash and pack that produce and get it delivered, but. That's not what you're talking about. You're talking about no. if I if I bought a share in your farm, I would come every week and harvest the vegetables for my share in your farm. That that's how it works. You actually come, you know, let's walk it through from the beginning. You 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 know, park there are a few people who ride bicycles, but most people drive. Park along a deep lane, as it's known, walk down into the valley, read the the board that we have at our farm stand and the farm stand is for the CSA members, not a retail stand. Uh, and every Tuesday and Saturday that board changes and the, the members read, okay, lettuce is in number 10, potatoes are in number 15, uh, bachelor buttons are in number 22, raspberries are down there in the valley in number 38. And then they march out into the field and they do their own harvesting and we leave forks for potatoes and carrots and that sort of thing. People are told to bring bags and to bring, you know, their own Felco clippers and that sort of thing. And they cut their own flowers. They do all that harvesting themselves, except for the, because it's grown so much, we have to grow the larger bulk crops like winter squash or something like that in another field, which is a half a mile away. And then we bring that back and put it at the stand, but we don't do any boxing up or anything like that. So the members do that themselves. And are you telling the members how much they can harvest or is it simply a matter of saying the potatoes are there, go get what you need? Or <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's, that's interesting that you chose potatoes because there isn't really a limit on potatoes, but for instance, on most things, you know, we'll say two lettuce and, and, uh, you know, or starting with, you know, a, a pint of cherry tomatoes or that sort of thing. And that's on a sign out in the field. So you read the board then you go out to, you know, where the numbered, uh, rows are in the field and, and there's more instruction there. And, you know, it's a, it's really an honor system. Um, but it's an honor system that, you know, has worked for 28 years. Amazing, really. It is. And where are your members coming from? 
Well, it's really a cross section of the Hamptons and um, the part <laughs> we could go on about, you know, what, what the Hamptons are, but um, besides the, you know, the, the, the glittery part of the Hamptons that you've heard about, there's, there's another side to the Hamptons, which is, you know, one of the oldest settled parts um, of certainly of the East coast. Um, these villages were, incorporated in 1648 you know i mean so this is this has been settled for a long time the the tradition of farming is very very deep here and uh and we sort of feel like you know we're we're just a new version of something that's been going on a long time so the people that come to harvest and are part of the farm are really a combination of people who are year-round people um and, and then also people who for maybe generations have been coming out here, you know, families have houses, um, maybe they live in New York and they're out on the weekends, that sort of thing. So it's quite a, quite a combination. And, and we've tried to include as much of the population out here as we can. We have all kinds of things going on to, to bring people into the community farm. I'm curious about the, the, the economic cross section that you get. Do you have people from all income levels being part of the CSA or Yeah, I mean, it is the Hamptons and, you know, it uh it uh, uh it's it's you, you just to live here, you know, takes a <laughs> uh takes a certain income. Uh but the people who are less fortunate in economically here, we try and bring in 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 other ways and we have done all kinds of different things like um, asking people to pay people who can to pay more uh, than you know the the normal share price, and then we've taken uh, some of that some of those funds and and given them to other people who can't afford. So in a way that that model hasn't worked really well to include other people, but we keep trying in whatever way we can. And there's other options so people can actually you know, be involved with the farm in other ways without purchasing a share as well. And when you say be involved in other ways, like going to farmer's market or buying yes. stuff at the store. Okay. Yeah, that's right. And we actually do a lot. We distribute a fair amount of produce to uh, a local food pantry, that sort of thing as well. And, um, uh, you know, we just, we, we have like open days where, where people can come and taste tomatoes and rate tomatoes and that sort of thing. And we have, you know, constantly have school groups coming. And so um, everybody uh, who lives in the Hamptons has an opportunity to, you know, participate in the, in the community farm. What does your share pricing look like, given that you don't really have much harvest labor invest in the final product? That's a good question. When we started, we looked around at, you know, the other, there weren't that many CSAs, but we looked around and, you know, at what the pricing was like for those. And, you know, I think back at that time, it was a share price might have been $400 or something like that. And, um, you know, but that's 28 years ago. And every year we've basically, you know, gone up by cost of living increase, but not much more than that. And, um, I mean, the present price is over $900, but that's for uh, – so members have done some investigation and, and gone to local supermarkets and local health food stores and that sort of thing. And we know that the share is worth much more than what it costs if indeed you know you follow through and, and do all your harvesting. It's really up to the member to do that. Um, but um, you know, it's certainly well worth it. <laughs> You said that the members are very involved in the farm, not just in this in this kind of this functional level of harvesting the produce, but also at that higher organizational level. Tell us a little bit more about that structure. Well, so we have this, you know, farm committee and a number of the people who've been on the farm committee uh, have been part part of it for, you know, over 20 years, I would say, but we're always trying to bring in new uh, new voices to that. And, and basically when we meet, we talk about, you know, the, the state of the state of the farm. We discuss everything from the economics, you know, including the share price, uh, to arranging community events. And, you know, in the first years we were really spending most, certainly the farmers were spending most of our energy on 
you know, figuring out how to grow the crops and renew the soil and all that sort of thing. But then we realized we weren't putting enough energy into the community aspect. And so um, we didn't have enough time to do to devote, you know, all the energy we should to that. So so members took that up. And so uh, we have certain events and 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 the members who are on the farm committee, you know, uh, enlist volunteers to run a farm breakfast that happens at the beginning of the year. We have a uh, tomato tasting. Uh, we have a, you know, potluck meal uh, with music, etc. in the apple orchard. Um, we have a one um, benefit dinner, uh, which is a long table dinner with 175 people uh, sitting at one long table in the apple orchard. And the members help with all of that. It wouldn't happen without them. Then there's the newsletter, you know, all those sorts of things. The things that really are the things that keep a CSA ticking. Uh, the members have a lot of involvement with that. You mentioned that you've got five tractors on the farm, you know, 35 acres of vegetables. And, and it really seems to me, as I was snooping around about you on the Google, yes, that Soil building is a really important element of your involvement in the farm. It's something that really speaks to you. Yeah, I mean, it's really the it's probably the basis of why I'm doing what I'm doing. And we've actually always said that the the farmer's job is really to build up the health of the soil. That's what we're there for. I mean, uh, we do have to grow some vegetables because people seem to want the vegetables. But building up the health of the soil is my favorite part of it. And uh, I always, I always uh, return to the beautiful phrase by um, Miriam McGillis of Genesis Farm, where she said the real health of a bioregion resides in the top six inches of topsoil. And uh, I believe that's true. And, um, and I've seen it in, in action here on our farm because we took over land uh, that was farmed in potatoes and corn, potatoes and corn, potatoes and corn. And, uh, and, and we, it needed needed to be revitalized. And, and so I've seen what, you know, this style of agriculture can do. And, uh, and it's a, it's a beautiful thing when you, you know, look at the shine on the cover crop that you're putting on in the fall and, uh, and, and that you can taste it in the vegetables as well. So we've done a lot to, to, uh, renew the vitality of the soil. It's really, really essential to everything we've done. At a practical level, how have you gone about that? Well, in the beginning, we, we used um, lots of compost, more than we use now, and probably it was easier then because we had less acreage, but we're lucky that we have two horse stables, two or three horse stables actually near to us, and they needed to do something with, with their manure, and we needed, uh, we needed it for our field, so we got into a, a composting, uh, you know, very heavily in the beginning and basically for the first year, probably for the first 10 years, I'd say we, we composted every year, every bit of ground that we were growing vegetables on. We, we don't do that every year now. And we've come to rely more on, um, cover cropping, uh, you know, the use of, of oats and rye with, with a legume, uh, Austrian winter peas are our favorite now. And, uh, and so we do a lot with that as well, but we're still composting when we, when we need to. And we, we, for the size farm we are, we use very little, you know, bought in fertilizer. Uh, so we're trying to do it with, you know, rotations and resting and cover cropping and all that sort of thing. And from a mechanical perspective, are there, tell me about your tillage practices and how those relate to the soil building effort. I'm so glad you have these kind of, I love, I love these kind of questions um, because so often, uh, I think probably because what we've been doing is is pretty unusual, you know, w w the combination of a a conservation organization and a and and the community agriculture and everything. But of course, um, you know, the basis of the farming aspect is you know quite rigorous and has to be if you're going to continue using the same soil year after year. So um, in the beginning. Um, I didn't talk about this, but there were some really important early meetings of community support agriculture held at a, a little Waldorf school in a place called Kimberton, Pennsylvania. And there were some pretty 
pretty good farmers there, and I learned a lot from them and uh, about you know uh, equipment, etc. And so, in when I came to the farm, uh, the only tillage instrument that was there was a rototiller, and it was obvious that that was going to really ruin the soil if used over and over again. So, uh, in the end, we you know we purchased you know, one implement a year for many years. And, uh, we, we use a chisel plow, uh, in a, a disc harrow and we finish it off, uh, with something called a perfecta. My, my, my favorite implement on the farm actually, or tractor implement. Um, and occasionally we use a rotor tiller, but very, very rarely. And, um, and that's really our, our major tillage, the chisel, chisel plow, basically. And then in your crop rotation, are you, you said you guys use a lot of cover crops. Are you pulling ground out for full years and, uh, and following as part of your rotation? Or is it really putting in the cover crops between vegetable crops every year? I think that's closer to it, your, what you've just said. Um, in the beginning, we actually, um, there was a, a great fellow, Tim Laird, who was farming with me in the beginning. And we, we had down on paper this beautiful seven year rotation and two of the years, you know, the last years after the, after the cropping, uh, were clove was clover. Um, but then we found we have a very particular problem and, and, and we've got, um, uh, nut grass or nut sedge, you know, loves our, our soil. And if we leave, uh, it's everywhere basically. And if we leave, uh, a ground fallow for, for too long, even even a year in some places, um, the next year it looks like we seeded, we plow it up, and and up comes the nutgrass, and it looks like we've uh, we've seeded nutgrass. So it actually is better for our system to put on really great cover crops and continue the tillage. But we do rest. Obviously, we're you know there there are sections that we're resting for at least a year. Um, probably not two years, but at least a year. And we're putting down uh, legumes to do that. We use clover a lot, really one of one of my favorite uh, seeds. I'm really sorry about the nut sedge, Scott. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. <laughs> that stuff is the worst. I mean, uh, and, and especially because, I mean, in my experience, it's really hard to kill with tractor-based cultivation because you're constantly cutting, you know, the, the, little, the little nuts like, two inches or three inches down in the soil and yes. it just keeps coming. It just keeps coming. Yeah. I, as I said, I mean, you, you, I, 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 you know, go out and look at, you know, say we've plowed up a piece of land and then we, I said, oh, I bring the apprentices out. And I said, look, look, look at this. It looks like we actually seeded, you know, nuts edge here. It's unbelievable. And then at that point, basically all you can do is, um, is, you know, plant the plants you determined to plant there somewhere else and 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 disc a number of times and bring the nut up to the surface and then it actually will dry out and then you can plant you know a fall crop something like that so that took us some years to figure out i i there was a um a great reply to a question i asked in, in the early years when when i asked the you know the the older farmers well what do we do with this nut grass and they said move your farm very, very helpful advice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and just thinking about the nut sedge coming up, say, in a field of lettuce, I mean, I would think that weed control, when you've got members out picking, I mean, it's it's one thing to take a, a group of employees out there and go, yeah, boy, this sucks. We're going to pick the beans out of the, you know, we got ragweed up in our faces, but we're just going to struggle through it. You're getting paid eight bucks an hour, so let's let's make it happen. Right. It's another thing to send your members out into that kind of an environment. Would you say that your farm is cleaner than your average organic vegetable farm? From a no, I mean, you know, on certain years, yes. I mean, but, you know, as we've expanded the acreage, you know, we've got we've got our share of weeds. Not, I, I guess I won't say I'm proud of them. <laughs> They're there. You know, it's a constant. I mean, it's part of organic farming. You, you've got to figure out what to do. And, uh, you know, there are sections where, you know, members are harvesting and, you know, say like the early greens or something that could keep going for a long time, get taken over. You just say, well, we just plant again. You do, you know, 
uh, turn that in and put in some buckwheat or something and, you know, seed some new crops. So, yeah, it's a it's a constant struggle uh, dealing with weeds. And is it something that your members are fairly understanding about? Yeah, I think, you know, in, ge- in general, they are. I mean, I think it's 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 you know, there's some we, we have a survey every year and and people do, you know, complain about this and that. And, you know, weeds are probably up there on the list because even, you know, say you, you, you know, seeded some flowers in the spring and, you know, beautiful patch. And all of a sudden, it, before you know it, it's taken over by, you know, um, some weed or another. And, and uh, you know, the members do a little complaining about, uh, about that. However, I think most of them, because we get so many positive responses and this is one of the things that's kept me going is that uh, of how appreciative the members can be you get come on a saturday and they so many people will say we really want to thank you for for what you're doing and you know we the farmers feel like we want to thank them because they're keeping us going but um they can be incredibly uh, gracious and and uh, appreciative of of the uh, uh, you know of what it takes to farm so um, and, you know, we're part, part of it is like members, if they're coming every week, they're seeing, OK, you have to look what you have to deal with. You have to deal with, you know, weed pressure or you have to deal with no rain or too much rain or whatever it is. And by actually being out there in the field, they actually can see that in a way. I think this is really one of the great things about our style is that uh, it's very different if you're picking up a box and easy to forget that you know it rained all week or something like that but our members know because they're actually out there in the field and can witness it and do you have a lot of interaction with those members when they show up to the farm well it's basically my saturday job my saturday morning job that's the busiest time uh for for members tuesdays are much quieter but um uh, on saturdays really a major part of my job is is to communicate with the members and, and, you know, I can, I can get, you know, some farm work done, but in between I'm at the stand and talking and, you know, um, I, I, I have to have a very public persona in that way. And, uh, and, uh, we, we try and encourage apprentices to do that too. It's very interesting because obviously, you know, half the people that come to apprentice, you know, aren't that interested in that kind of public contact, but it's really a major part of, of the kind of community agriculture that we're, we're performing. So, um, that relationship is really integral to, to, to the whole thing. You mentioned interns. How many people do you have working with you on the farm? Uh, so every year, and this is an important part of our operation, we, uh, hire, uh, apprentices and we've actually um over the now we're actually calling it an advanced apprenticeship then because we felt there was a gap there um in 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 apprenticeship training so we have four to six apprentices and then we have some um some summer help uh who you know slot in there during the during the sort of major months of the summer so we have a, a total of of 10 uh, 10 workers probably at, you know, in the heat of the summer and two year round people, there's myself, the director, and then Layton, uh, who is, is uh, the farm manager has now been here for, I think five years and late Layton's a year round employee as well. So the, and, and, and then every year, you know, we used in the beginning, we had to sort of hunt around and find apprentices. Now we get lots of applications and, People know about us, and there's just so many more people interested in learning in learning this style of agriculture. So you said you've got an advanced internship program as well. Tell me about that. Well, we actually felt that, um, you know, there were now many farms offering apprenticeships, and we know this because, um, you know, a number of our apprentices have wanted to keep going and, and, and learn from another farm. And and so that obviously there are lots of options all over the country, um, but we felt the thing that was lacking, and we kind of learned this from the people who were coming to our farm was is is that how do you take the next step and actually learn to manage a farm or you know learn to 
enough about an operation so that you can start your own, whether it's a you know small scale or not. And so we are looking and we're hiring people with uh, some experience and sometimes a fair amount of experience and trying to give them, uh, you know, a lot more insight into all aspects of, of what it takes to run a farm. Well, that's a really easy thing to say. How do you actually <laughs> go about doing that? How do you structure that experience for those interns so that they are getting a real understanding of what it really means to run a farm instead of just what it means to be out thinning the carrots? Well, um, I, I guess I should mention that Leighton, our farm manager, uh, after farming for years um, at a, you know, a, 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 a production farm, uh, went to Santa Cruz and was, you know, part of the, the Santa Cruz uh, program, which is, I think, now celebrating its 50th year or something. Uh, and, uh, you know, there you actually pay to, to, to learn all different aspects of, of gardening and farming rather than getting paid. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a structured study. Uh, so we've used elements of that and we have, um, uh, we have this rotation system where each apprentice is in charge of one aspect, whether it be the greenhouse, uh, you know, or the, uh, the marketing aspect or the crew leader or whatever in each one of those rotations um, has a, the person has a lot of responsibility. And of course they're checking in with Leighton and myself, uh, but that's like a three week rotation and then they switch and they learn another, another aspect. Of it. So everybody and, you know, the tractor maintenance and the tractor work and everything is part of, you know, those rotations as well. So you're really learning a little bit about, you know, what it takes to run the whole, the whole thing. One of the challenges with bringing in, you know, even a higher level intern, somebody who's maybe had some experience on a farm and then giving them real responsibility is making sure that you've got systems in place where you make sure that they aren't going to fail spectacularly. I'm thinking yeah. about, I'm thinking yeah. in particular about, you know, tractor operation, but even with, even with a rotation or, you know, any number of other jobs, I mean, man, you could screw up a whole lot of stuff in a hurry. Have you put systems in place to help people keep from making dramatic mistakes while at the same time to have the opportunity to really engage in a learning process? I hope so. You know, that's a, that is the challenge. I mean, it's, I mean, to be quite honest, I mean, it's good to be honest here. It's not, um, if you wanted to choose the most efficient way of running a farm, you, you wouldn't hire new people every year. Um, but you know, we are actually, we've chosen that as part of our mission and it's a really important part of it. And so, yeah, we have tried to put in, you know, every year we're, you know, we're, working on that structure and trying to trying to make it better and uh, takes a lot of um, conversation and communication and check-ins and all that sort of thing. And on a farm, I mean, you know, it's, you just, you got to work on that. I mean, basically it's, it's part of, you know, um, the never ending drive for efficiency basically. Uh, and part of our mission is to educate younger people in, you know, this style of agriculture. And, and, you know, that's part of our not-for-profit mission, basically. So, yeah, we're basically always working on that. Are there certain jobs that you've held out of that rotation for the interns that, that you're holding on to tightly for yourself? Yeah, I mean, still, when it comes to the tractor work, I mean, we, you know, um, uh, myself and Leighton do a lot of it. Um, and then we watch for uh, the people who it comes more naturally to and try and train them to take take a little bit more on or something. Uh, and then, of course, there's the, you know, I mean, I have a, you know, a, a, we all have job descriptions written down on paper and, you know, I've got a million tasks and responsibilities and that sort of thing. And parts of them, you know, I have to do or Leighton has to do that have to do with member communication and, uh, you know, setting up, uh, the, the farm committee meetings and, uh, dealing with, um, 
nearby landowners that would be important aspects. So yeah, there, there are multiple parts that the apprentices don't take part in, but you know, that's there, there's plenty for them to do as well. With the apprentices you know, in the farmer training aspect, do you have training that happens outside of the activity on the farm? In other words, do you have, do you have classroom time as well as on the job, hands in the dirt, elbow to elbow training? Yeah, we do. And that varies a little bit every year by, by who, who, who is there, who, what, what, who, who the, who the learners are and, you know, what the personnel is. Um, but there's also, we're part of a, a, a craft network, um, which the first one I know of started in the Hudson Valley. And, um, you know, the way that that is set up is that the apprentices, uh, along with apprentices from other farms or workers on, on other nearby farms, travel to one farm or another to learn the specific specific operation of that farm. And so we, we've helped to create a craft network like that here. And, um, you know, during the season, uh, there's multiple chances to go uh, see what's happening. We're on the South Fork. Go and see what someone's doing on the North Fork or someone who's focusing on on raising uh, raising birds for eggs or meat, or uh, someone who's uh, fo- focusing on growing grains, that kind of thing. And so the the apprentices get kind of all the training they want to participate in 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 that respect. That's taken some years for that to happen. But besides that, we're also uh, sitting down and you know talking about different members, uh, different aspects of the of the of the farm operation everything from the uh, economics to you know how to how to pack vegetables for wholesale that kind of thing with that we're going to stop here take a break get a quick word from a couple of sponsors and then we'll be right back with scott chasky of quail hill farm in amagansett new york the farmer to farmer podcast is generously supported by bcs america a bcs two-wheel tractor is the only power equipment a market gardener will need with pto driven attachments like the florida tiller flail mower, power harrow, rotary plow, snow thrower, log splitter, and more. You name it, and you can probably run it with a versatile BCS two-wheel tractor. The first time I used a rototiller way back in 1991, it was mounted to a BCS two-wheel tractor, and it spoiled me for life. When you get behind a BCS, you can tell that it's built to the same commercial standards as four-wheel farm tractors, and it has many of the same features. I've used other tillers and mowers and spent most of the time that I was using them thinking of how much easier it would be with a BCS. Check out bcsamerica.com to see the full lineup of tractors and attachments, plus videos of BCS in action. Perennial support for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is provided by Vermont Compost Company. I asked Scott about his potting soil, and here's what he had to say. When we started seeding for transplants at our farm, the seed mix was extremely important to us. We, we, we know it's important to the life of the plant. And we actually brought in uh, an advisor. We got a SARE grant and a fellow named Will Brinton, uh, known as the Julia Child of Composting, came and advised us on creating our own seed starting mix. And we did that for many years, but we kept growing as a farm and it just took, you know, more and more time as we grew more and more plants, etc. And at some point we said, we have to do something different. And we checked into different potting mixes and uh, Vermont's uh, compost mix. And we thought it was um, about as good as what we'd been making ourselves. And uh, we made the switch. And since that time, I think for probably at least the last six, seven years, something like that, we've been using Vermont compost for all of our seed starting processes. And um, it's just great stuff. I know and I believe in the work that Carl's done for many years. We met in the early years uh, through NOFA New York. And I always went back to to Carl's um, workshops because I said, this person knows a lot about how to create a sustainable agriculture. VermontCompost.com. All right. And we're back with Scott Chasky of Quail Hill Farm in Amagansett, New York. So Scott, you mentioned that you had spent 10 years in England before you came back to the States and ended up working at Quail Hill Farm and eventually taking over the management. What were you doing in England? Well, I actually went, um, I studied literature in, in college and um, took a few years off and roamed around. 
and before go, deciding, well, maybe it was time to go go back and uh, and get a graduate degree. And I found a luckily found a program through Antioch College, um, uh, uh, an MFA, a Master's in Fine Arts and Writing. And uh, the reason I was attracted to it first was because the summer program was in Ireland and uh, my mother was born in Ireland and I'd always wanted to uh, see the country there. And and um, that first attracted me. So I went and um, and then uh, the year round program was in uh, London, actually, in a place called the the Center for British Studies. Uh, and the fellow who ran the program, a guy named Michael Lynch, uh, lived in Oxford. And I went to visit and fell in love with with Oxford. And uh, he managed to get me a reader's ticket to the Bodleian Library. And um, so I spent two years living living in Oxford and uh, and met uh, Megan, my my wife to be, who had another interesting connection with England uh, with, with um, a tiny little fishing village called Mausel, but spelled Mousehole in Cornwall, the southwest <laughs> tip of England. And uh, through a kind of magical um, rainbow of fate, we wound up living in, uh, in a little fishing village in Mausel in Cornwall. We stayed there for eight years, had got married there, had our first house there, had our first child, etc. And that's where I learned to garden was uh, first in Oxford and then and then in Cornwall. Learning to garden in Cornwall, did you have the kind of great soils that you're farming with in Long Island? Well, uh, <laughs> we, the, the, the soil quality was probably very similar. The the um, the landscape was really quite different because I actually learned um, in these cliff meadows, they're called incredibly steep. So that actually it all was done with shovels and something called a chipper. It was all done by hand. Couldn't even get a rototiller. They were so steep, really magical um, facing a, a, a beautiful bay called Mounts Bay named after St. Michael's Mount, a castle rising on a top of an island that we looked out at. And um, and these cliff meadows were known as the first ground in Britain. And when I heard that, I thought, wow, that's an amazing thing. I, I want to be somehow involved in that. What that meant was that these Cornwall is the mildest climate in England, although that's a mild is an odd terminology when you're talking about Cornwall because the winds are so ferocious there. But um, the first new potatoes and the first flowers to find their way to London uh, and Covent Garden Market all came from these particular meadows. And that um, the historical uh, quality of that just entranced me. And, and I had a great mentor, uh, a character named Edgar Wallace, who had worked in those meadows all his life. And uh, I learned a lot about the soil and working with the soil and about plants and and about the patience it uh, it takes to to be a gardener or a farmer. I'm always fascinated by what people studied, and and how they ended up in farming after studying it. But I mean, and, and in part because you know when I when I finished my college degree, it was in horticulture, and ah. you know it seemed very practical. And 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 then I went off and marched on my merry way to go work on other more vegetable farms, and eventually become a vegetable <laughs> right. farmer. Right. And, all, all right. seem very logical, um, you know, but but I also know because I I also had a background in liberal arts that 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 also has an impact on on how a person approaches their farm. And you were studying literature, and I know that you're a poet. How how has how has your involvement with literature and and your your writing and your poetry influenced your farming? Well, it's a wonderful question. And I, I, I'm sure you would guess this, that I've done a fair amount of time thinking about that and trying to come up with a, a simple answer. And I, I've never arrived at that simple answer. Uh, but the, the, the basic fact is that they go together so well. And, uh, and I've never felt 
that they were separate at all. There's a wonderful, I, 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 I couldn't come up with the, the one line myself, but I have a, 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 a friend named Lisa Wyshnovich who farms at Mountain Dell Farm uh, with her husband, Mark Dunau. And she's a poet as well. And, and here's a line that from, from Lisa. In farming, I toil at what nature does easily. And in poetry, I work at the ephemeral by attempting to embody time in language. So that's probably not an answer that's going to satisfy a lot of people, but that's about as close as I can get. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been a, uh, a real privilege to be able to uh, study language and to study the language of the, of the earth at the same time. And I know from experience that it's not necessarily an easy thing to do, to take the time to do that writing, to, to notice your surroundings, to cultivate the sense of wonder that, that I think that poetry almost demands from a person. How have you made the time or men maybe made the time's not the right question, but how have you made that work for you personally? Yeah, you know, the thing about writing poetry especially is that you need, it, it's not just time, it's time and space or whatever that magic is that connects them. And that's been difficult to, to find and to kind of protect. Uh, but, you know, there is the winter and uh, when things quiet down in a farm. So I, I've, I've always used that. Um, and years ago when, when I was learning gardening in England um, and from these great mentors, um, I, I had more, you know, before, before kids, you know, et cetera, I had more time to spend every morning sitting at my desk. And so I developed, you know, the kind of discipline uh, that that takes. And I think it was really, really a, a great advantage to learn that early on. Um, later, you know, I've now written a couple of books, um, nonfiction books of prose, and I find it's actually much easier. It's not easy, but it's easier to to write prose than than poetry, and that's probably one reason that I turn to that. And um, and so I, the the last fifteen years or so, I've actually been writing. I've been writing more in a nonfiction style than in poetry. But the poetry, I hope, is incorporated into the into that prose as well. So I don't know. It's a challenge, but if you have to do it, you. You have to do it. There's kind of there's kind of no escaping, and uh, it's there in 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 sort of every breath I take. Do you have a poem that you'd like to share with us today? Well, i i could um, i could I could read you a very small poem from from my book Seed Time. Uh, Seed Time with the the subtitle on the history, husbandry, politics, and promise of seeds. And there's a chapter where I wove in, um, I mean, I hope the prose is, is, is poetic throughout, but there's a chapter where I talk about um, mythology and, and mythology as it relates to um, the language of the earth. And the chapter is called Acrobatic Time. And I'll read you a, a small poem from that. Red ivy seeds rain and split on dark earth. Winter beads on stone, light binds acrobatic time. The agitation of wind, mound moves and limb and cone. Look at that great space of birds. So that's just a little lyric poem from Seed Time. I mean, seeds are an obvious thing to talk about on a farming <laughs> yes. podcast. Um, but not everybody makes the time to write a book about seeds and and it seems like that's been an important part of your work are you involved in seed saving or or uh conservation there at quail hill farm well we do as much as we can you know it's some it's the 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 um i wish i wish we did more but we do some and um really i think we're probably more involved with making sure that we support the people who who are really focused on that as their livelihood, you know, um, from 
Tom Stearns at High Mowing uh, Seeds to uh, our friends at Fruition Seeds or the Hudson Valley Seed Library. Um, so we're we're supporting the work that people in our region are doing. And of course, on our own farm, we're saving whatever seeds we can. It's an extremely, I just sort of think it's the next frontier. It's what was lost. It's the way that, you know, human beings have always um, kept agriculture alive. And, uh, and the revival of the skills of seed saving are so important now. So, you know, we've gotten involved with it in that way. So when you're doing that on your farm and, and, you know, in my, my background, I entered into agriculture largely through doing genetic preservation, uh, spent time in, in plant breeding programs at the University of Wisconsin and, and uh, as, a, as a student and as a worker, and, and then managed the gardens at Seed Savers Exchange for a couple of years back in the mm. 1990s, and, and, mm. and then went and started my own farm, never saved a single seed. Um, <laughs> and, right. and I'm curious what crops you're saving seeds on and, and how you go about maintaining those varieties in a, in a really productive fashion. Well, tomatoes largely. And, um, perhaps it's because, um, you know, there's such a fascination with the, with the tomato itself and the process of, of, you know, saving the seed going through the fermenting of the seed and all that sort of thing is, is a fascinating process. So, um, you know, we've, we've, it's almost impossible to, you know, work at isolating. So, but we have had, you know, some luck in saving some peppers, that kind of thing. I think we've saved, we've saved flower seeds. I think one year we actually saved burdock. I'm not quite sure why we did that. Um, but you know, we, we have Susan Ashworth's wonderful book about seed to seed, I think it's called. And, and, you know, we work with apprentices to, you know, teach them, uh, about the methods and uh, and then we just do whatever we can. I mean, when you talked about not saving a single seed is because, well, talk about finding time to to write poetry. How do you find time to save seeds? But it's it's a fascinating process. And, you know, we're uh, amateurs at it. But um, so is everyone to start with, basically. You said tomatoes. Now, it's my understanding that you haven't always been a tomato fan. <laughs> You've heard that. <laughs> um, oddly, I, you know, who knows what that was? Yeah, I didn't really grow up enjoying tomatoes at all, maybe because I never tasted a, what we call an heirloom tomato. And in the first couple of years of the farm, uh, the other fellow that was farming with, with me, neither of us really had much of a fascination with it. And then we started, you know, experimenting and growing some of the, some of the older varieties and thought, wow, what a flavor this has. And, uh, uh, I've never looked back since then. So, yeah, I, I, I think it was a late love affair with the tomato, but um, it's it's there. I want to go back to Cornwall uh, mm-hmm. because I think it's always so I. It, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's always interesting to to make that move from from gardening to farming. And I'm curious what lessons you brought from Cornwall to Amagansett, because I, I, I'm thinking about farming in those those cliff meadows, mm-hmm. and and I'm thinking about you know the hand tools and the and and just the that long history in mm-hmm. Cornwall. Mm-hmm. What did you bring from there that helped you to succeed at Quail Hill Farm? I mean, I guess one of the reasons I you know pursued uh, the study of literature. In, in England was was because of the you know the great history and the heritage that was there and um, it was really a, a, a such a rare and unusual experience to you know spend uh, hours every day studying in this one of the great libraries in the world the Bodleian Library right in the center of Oxford uh, and and the 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 immersion in these, you know, the history of the place is what I actually felt when I was working on the land there as well. And somehow I had never had that opportunity in this country. I mean, I grew up in the 1950s outside of 
Buffalo, New York, in a place called Tonawanda. And although we used to go visit my grandparents, and I remember, you know, picking blueberries as a young child and all that sort of thing, um, but I never felt um, immersed in a. Uh, I didn't. I didn't feel the 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 ancient vibration from the earth that I that I felt uh, when when I was in Ireland and England. And and whatever that is, um, I wanted to be part of that more. I, and so that led to, you know, uh, it's very hard to describe what that, uh, you know, uh, that that feeling in your body is for uh, for uh, feeling connected to land or to the earth. But I got it when I was there and I got it first through a study of literature and then through uh, learning gardening. When I came back to this country, there was a sort of a, I, I had that now. So I had that in my system, you know, I, uh, the bodily sensation that was, that was really a kind of necessity to work, work with the earth. Uh, but at the same time, there was a social aspect um, where I felt, um, well, some big change is needed in, you know, this society, the society I grew up in. That's probably why I left it. Oh, I know that's why I left it for many years, so that I could look at it again from the outside rather than from the inside. And and here was this thing. Uh, now that I had this this need to actually you know work with the soil, here was this thing called community supported agriculture. When and it just happened right when when I was returning from England, and and that incorporation. Of, of actually working with the soil and working with the earth and also rediscovering um, a real sense of community and what community could be, that's, it was just magical. And, and that's really turned out to be my life's work, really. And as an employee at the Peconic Land Trust, and having been one for a very long time now, you, you mentioned having kids and how that changed your schedule. And, and I'm, I'm interested in how you structure your work, you know, because as a farmer and I've been both, I've been both an employee as a farm manager and I've also ran my own farm for, for a yeah. long time. And, and, yeah. and it was, they were very different experiences. And I, I guess I'm, I'm interested to know how you structure your work days and your work weeks and, and how that might be influenced by being an employee versus being a, a farm owner for better or for worse. Well, I guess what I saw is <laughs> uh, I should mention that, you know, I, I, I think my, my, uh, my folks always, you know, looked at me, you know, like, well, you know, maybe he's going to settle down someday. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't really have, I never had health benefits, for instance, until I was 39 years old. But, you know, by that time I had kids and it seemed like a wise thing to do. And so uh, being an employee in that style, I mean, I, I started working when I was 16 years old. So, you know, I had many, many jobs. Um, but being, you know, an employee and, uh, you know, getting into a more structure, a, a tighter structure was something new to me, but it was incorporated with something I really believed in, you know, and it gave me a sense of purpose. And that was this thing called community supported agriculture. So, um, you know, um, I don't know, it's how, how you know, I, I could go into the details um, a little bit more, but, you know, raising three children and, and uh, being involved with an incredibly, you know, busy farm and, and working on building up the community and everything is just something you do if you love it, basically. And, and, and I feel lucky that I, I, I actually, I actually found that it's it, the, in, in a way the, uh, you know, you, you learn a lot from the things that you're, you know, you're asked to do by, uh, by, by your experience and by the, uh, and, you know, by what, what comes up in your life. And, uh, I just have to say that probably, um, you know, having to, uh, uh, create more structure for the actual farming and because of the farming also benefited, um, my, my writing life as well. So do you have strict work hours that you keep at the farm or is it, 
is it a keep going and I mean, you know, there's yeah. there's different approaches to that, right? Yeah, there's, yeah, yeah. No, it used to be it used to be um uh quite strict, you know, for twenty some years or something like that. And in the last years I've pulled back from that structure and I float a lot more. I still probably spend almost as many hours, but my hours are, are different and I do spend my earlier morning hours uh, writing or reading now, and uh, I, I had to do that when I had a book contract, and I had to get the book the book in, and uh, and the only way I could do that was to actually spend every morning uh, writing um, to uh, finish that book, especially the book Seed Time, because it took so much research, and then I would you know arrive at the farm. Uh, by that time, we had a you know, a great farm manager, Layton, and Layton kept kept the gears going and, you know, kept the field work going and everything. And then I sort of stepped into my director role. So um, I'm not sure how helpful that yeah. that kind of structure is to people who are starting off in farming, probably not helpful at all. But it might be helpful to know that later on, um, you know, you might have the ability to continue to be you know, really intensely involved with the farming, but also have a little bit more freedom on the hours that you spend doing it. Well, I think on the farm, you know, just like there's seasons in the year, I think there's seasons in the, in the growth and development of the business. And you would hope that that frantic, frenetic beginner's pace doesn't go on forever. Yeah. Yeah. You would hope, you would hope that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We've talked about Layton as the farm manager and you as the farm director. Mm -hmm. Now, it seems pretty clear that there was a point when, when you, were, you were doing the work that Layton is doing now. Can you tell us a little bit about how that transition happened and, and how your relationship with Layton worked? Yeah, I think the, um, the job of farm manager uh, came about because originally there was, you know, me doing that. And actually my, my title was, was farm manager, uh, and then, uh, and then apprentices, etc. Um, there were just, you know, the, as the farm kept growing, there were just so many other aspects. There were just more work to be done, basically, even if you just, someone, someone had to really focused on, on the tractor work on preparing the fields and, and, you know, making sure the, the greenhouses were in order and that sort of thing and bringing a farm manager on to really focus on that aspect of it, uh, allowed me to turn my attention to the other, uh, aspects of community building and, and, you know, the finances and all that kind of thing. So, um, you know, it's a growth, it's kind of a natural growth as a, as a business grows. And, and if you're not aware of that, what's going to happen, you're just going to get, uh, swamped by all the details and, um, you know, and, and the, the business will be in chaos. So, um, I guess we, we, we were aware when that, when that time came and we've actually had a few different, at one time we did have a market manager and we've now sort of folded the market manager job into one of the, of the advanced apprentice rotations so you sort of, you know, you test the waters and see how you're going and measure it at the end of the year and decide what, what you can do to change things and make things more efficient. That's a really important part of the whole farming enterprise, really. Was there anything in particular that, that happened or developments that occurred on the farm that led you to bring in somebody as a farm manager and to kind of move into more of that director position yourself? I think it was just the growth. I think, uh, you know, it's just a matter of numbers and, you know, the, the, the acreage and more people and, you know, uh, you know, the, I mean, I'm not the kind of person that feels that, you know, um, you know, I, I like growth to be, you know, a, a more natural process. So I don't feel that, you know, when you start with a hand push rototilly, you have to own many tractors at some point. I just feel that if you want to continue the work you're doing and serve more people, um, then it becomes a matter of scale and recognizing uh, what is the scale that you feel most comfortable with. So, I mean, I, I actually feel that um, 
I'm most comfortable. I was most comfortable back around 20 acres, you know, so we've gone a little beyond that. So maybe that was the point where, um, where I said, well, we need, we need someone else in here too. With that, Scott, we're going to turn to our lightning round, but first we're going to get a quick word from one more sponsor. This lightning round is brought to you by Farmers Web, software for your farm. Farmers Web makes it easy to work with your buyers, saving you time, increasing efficiency, reducing mistakes, and streamlining order management. Farmers Web helps you manage orders from buyers who place them online and also those that order by phone or by email. Use Farmers Web to generate a product catalog for buyers, allow buyers to view your real time availability online, and create harvest lists and packing slips for your orders. Farmers Web helps you inform your buyers of delivery routes, pickup locations, lead times, and more while helping you keep track of special pricing and customer information. You can also download detailed financial reports. Farmers Web offers a free account type and flat monthly fee on paid plans. You can pause, cancel, or switch plan types at any time. Check out a demo video and Farmers Web guide to working with wholesale buyers at FarmersWeb.com. So Scott, what's your favorite tool on the farm? Well, my favorite, considering all the years, I, I, I might have to say the Dibbler. And when you say the Dibbler, tell me about your Dibbler and how you're using it. Well, the one that we used solely for many years um, uh, before, you know, we we got the water wheel transplanter um, uh, was um, formed out of a, a piece of black um, and piece of piece of uh, white uh, uh, pipe that was um, uh, the price was a, a six pack of beer off the back of a of, of an electrical truck. Uh, then uh, Tim Laird, who was the maker of the Dibbler, you know, he and I figured out the spacing that we needed for all the different plants that we we're planting, and then uh, we made dibbles out of um, bits of apple wood from the from the orchard. Uh, they're screwed into the into the Dibbler, and then made handles out of the out of apple wood as well those handles have been replaced a bunch of times and then you pull the thing down the row and it makes the holes and you can switch the dibbles and whether the plants are 20 inches apart or 12 inches apart or whatever and you can do two rows or one row or three rows and then whoever it is that's planting whether it's a five-year-old visiting the farm or a 80-year-old member helping out they know where to put the plants Pretty basic, but what a great, and boy, it's been a lot of conversation about that dibbler. What's your favorite crop to grow? Garlic. Didn't, didn't have to ask me twice about that. I love growing garlic. I love everything about it. I, I, I love the flavor of it and what you can do with it. And of course we eat it every day, but I also love the fact that you plant it in the autumn and you it's the only thing really we're planting at that time around halloween and then it's in the ground for you know eight months and so you get to live with it so it's sort of more than you get out of most you know annual plants and 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 you know it's not a perennial um so it's probably a little bit less work keeping it for many many years and then i just love the look of it and the fact that it produces these twirling scapes and I don't know. I love everything about it, basically. You've got, and this is radio, so not everybody's going to know this, but you've got an amazing white beard. Ah. <laughs> so I do. Used to be red. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I used to be called Carrot Top, as a matter of fact, when I was younger. So I'm a, I'm a redhead. How do you keep your white beard clean on the farm? Uh, well, <laughs> well, probably on the farm, it's not very clean, but when I come home, I... <laughs> I can tend to it. Um, you know, you gotta gotta sort of keep on top of it. <laughs> now you're a writer and and have have published a couple or several books. Um, yes. What's the last book that you read by somebody else? Oh gosh, I've been reading. I I I, I have quite an eclectic taste and I've been, I always have a poetry book going and a, a history and, and a novel. Um, I just read a really beautiful book called the house at Ottawa bridge that was written many years ago. And it's actually illustrated by my mother-in-law who's a painter, Connie Fox and such a beautiful story. 
and it takes place. It's about really a, a, a quite remarkable woman who um, uh, lived in New Mexico and oddly the story of the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos is woven into this story, but it's really a very beautiful book, The House at Ottawa Bridge. And finally, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Have patience and, and, and develop patience and um, learn to respect and, uh, and to learn more uh, every day from, from the land that you you have the privilege to work with. Scott Chasky, thank you so much for being part of the Farmer to Farmer podcast today. Well, thank you, Chris. It's really, really been a pleasure. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 152 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. And you can find the notes for this show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Chasky. That's C-H-A-S-K-E-Y. The transcript for this episode is brought to you by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk-behind farming equipment and high-quality garden tools in North America. And by Osborne Quality Seeds, a dedicated partner for growers. Visit osborneseed.com for high-quality seed, industry-leading customer service, and fast order fulfillment. Additional funding for transcripts is provided by North Central SARE, providing grants and education to advance innovations in sustainable agriculture. You can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast right in your inbox by signing up for my email newsletter at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Also, please head on over to iTunes, leave us a review if you enjoy the show, or talk to us in the show notes, or tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. And hey, when you talk to our sponsors, please let them know how much you appreciate their support of a resource you value. You can support the show directly by going to farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash donate. And finally, please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmer to farmer podcast.com. And I will do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running.